important decisions. And so we want to highlight some of this. Okay. Um, so we have two abstracts, just two. Unfortunately, our third um, presenter is not able to join us. So you guys have a little bit more time, which is good. So we have two presenters. We first have um, a story from South Africa. Uh, Tony will be presenting from his South Africa on how we're using a superset to analyze and do some advanced analytics with DHS2. And then after that, we have uh, John Painter from CDC PMI. He'll be coming up and presenting on how he's using some R uh, to do some very advanced analytics uh, as well. I'm going to gloom some interesting insights from the, from the malaria data he's working with. So I think with that, Tony, are you ready? Okay, I'll hand it over. Great. Thank you. Hey, Singh, can you guys hear me? Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the session. I'm Tanya Govinda. I'm the Projects Portfolio Manager from His South Africa, and my co colleague Comfort Manga, who is probably still having lunch as usual, will join us soon, but he will cover any technical aspects or any technical queries that you may have uh, following the presentation. All right. So for today's presentation, I will be taking you through um, the use case. I will introduce to you the um, um, superset solution. We will talk a little bit about the data analysis from the multiple data sources. I will introduce the DHIS superset um, portal app. And I will take you through the next steps that we envision for the future. Uh, before I continue, I would also like to get to know you a little bit better. So by the show of hands, how many of you are developers? Great. Cool. And uh, product uh, project managers, program managers, product implementers? Awesome. And um, how about people that actually is utilizing the data? So data analysts here? Awesome. Well, that's really nice. I see some of you have your hand up for all three, which is super cool. So welcome to the session. I hope that you will find it quite interesting. So for a use case, um, while we were implementing a project in South Africa, we were actually faced with a challenge regarding um, uh, reporting limitations. We knew what we wanted, right? We wanted um, to have um, reporting from multiple data sources with different data models. We needed to expand on the visualization capabilities and we knew that we needed a business intelligence tool to do that. We wanted to analyze existing DHIS2 data together with non-DHIS2 data. We were quite aware of the licensing costs and the cost of ownership. We also um, still wanted to utilize the existing DHIS2 systems, but we needed um, a tool that would complement that technology. So what did we do? And you're also aware that um, we collect all sorts of different data from different sources. And the need to actually bring that together, analyze and present that from a central point without having to reinvent the wheel actually presented this um, interesting opportunity to the team. Um, and of course, all of this needed to be done in the most cost-effective way and the tools needed to be super user-friendly. Um, and also what we were considering and prioritizing was the, the cost of ownership to the client to make sure that that cost of ownership is as low as possible to promote the sustainability and the institutionalization of the product. So what did we do? We pushed on. We were looking for a solution and we knew we were going to find it. Our vision was clear of combining data from multiple data sources. We knew that business intelligence tools would provide the technology to combine multiple data sources and enable a single point of advanced analytics. 
And we were aware that proprietary business uh, intelligence tools does carry quite a, um, a heavy licensing fees. So we had to make it effect cost effective and sustainable for implementation. With all of this information in mind, his South Africa then embarked on a process of setting up the Apache Superset as a business intelligence tool. So why Apache Superset? And apologies for the, for the headings of my slides. I think the, it doesn't recognize this font. So why is Apache Superset? One, it's free and open source, so we didn't have to um, be too concerned about the licensing fees. Two, it has an awesome interactive filtering um, capability so the user could actually interact with the data. It has wide SQL database support, so this enables us to handle and integrate multiple source um, configurations from different sources. It has its own user and role management plat um, component, which then allows us to manage the access that user has, the, the users have to different reporting with the aim of replicating the user management system from uh, the user management app in DHIS2 and um, align that with the superset uh, software. The reports are easy to share and uh, that they can be downloadable and they can be shared on the multiple communication platforms. And then lastly, it does have a community of practice to support us during this implementation. So how did we implement this? So, so far, HISP South, HISP South Africa is utilizing the superset in two projects. Firstly, it is the South African Human Resource, uh, sorry, the South African Health Management Information System, where we have set up a superset dashboard for the Minister of Health. The second project is the Human Resources Information System, where we are combining human resources information with routine health data. Now, there are several ways in which um, SuperSend can actually connect with the source data. But for the purpose of this use case, I will be talking more towards the human resources implementation. So the Apache Drill is an open source database connection tool that we used to use, that we use as a connector between uh, SuperSend and the source data. Apache Superset can still speak to your um, DHIS2 APIs and other systems such as Citus Data, Fire. It also, um, it also integrates with um, Python and Streamlit, which we are using for machine learning in the country. This diagram actually shows how Superset is pulling um, data from DHIS2 systems and other a source data through the Apache drill connector. So all of the data that you are looking for is actually pulled into the superset platform. You set up your dashboards in superset. And what is really cool and what we're so excited to share with you today is actually the DHIS2 superset portal app. This app allows you to communicate and to interact with the, with the dashboards that have been set up in the superset. So now that we've implemented, what um, does the solution now allow us to do? What are, what are the benefits that we are seeing and how are we utilizing it? So firstly, it does allow us to analyze data from different source data in a single dashboard. It provides more visualization capabilities that is currently not possible in DHIS2. It is fast, it is lightweight, it is intuitive, it has loads of um, analysis and visualization capabilities. It is easy uh, for the users to utilize, 
And it has capabilities from simple pie charts or graphs to your detailed geospatial graphs as well. Overall, we found that there's not really a need to pull all sorts of data into one huge warehouse, but rather have the analytics that can be displayed through the DHIS dashboards using the linkage of superset connecting to your source data. This is the superset dashboard and um, why we would recommend for you to use it. It expands on the visualization options of DHIS2. It allows the user to actually interact with the superset dashboards that have been created through the DHIS platform. You only need um, a super user to be able to set up the dashboards in superset and then um, share those uh, dashboards with the user through the user management roles and groups in DHIS. It allows for advanced superset reporting capabilities from the DHIS2 interface and the generic superset functionality makes it available to any DHIS2 implementation. So what are the next steps that we envision for the future? DHIS2 has a user management app and Superset has a module for user management as well. So we are currently looking at aligning the user access in DHIS2 and Superset for the seamless integration of user management. Secondly, we would the Superset um, app is generic and can be plugged into a Superset um, in installation with the documentation available for the implementation of the Apache drill. The portal can benefit lots of DHIS communities, and the app will be submitted to the DHIS2 app hub for your consumption. We would also like to expand our the Superset app to different projects that we are implementing in South Africa. The successful implementation of Superset will be expanded to other projects and bring business intelligence and DHIS, combining business analytics, data mining, data visualizations, best practices, and more data-driven decision-making, creating better lives for all. Obviously, this work would not be possible without our funders, our clients, and all the contributors and the HISP team. So we're really grateful for that, and we thank all of the contributors. Thank you so much. We can take a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I'll invite my colleague Comfort. Yep, please. I don't mind sharing the center stage. <laughs> Let me hand this over to you, Comfort. So if someone asks a question, just repeat the question for everybody online. Okay. Thank you. You know, one of the really cool things about this is everybody is always saying, we can't make this chart in DHIS2 because you want something like a box and whisker, wind rows, like these really advanced charts. But now look, you can. You just got to go through, su su use the app. Super set. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, Nora. One moment, when did we lost that a woman developer standing up there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Sorry, you have to say why we were applauding. Oh, for everyone online. I've just got a wonderful applause for being a woman representing um, software development teams. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Are you excited about the app? I see a question at the top. Okay. The question is um, 
I mentioned that we're using Python for machine learning and how does that fit into the, into the presentation? So I was saying that um, the superset has um, capabilities to connect with DHIS2 API as well as other systems. So um, other systems, including fire, other systems, including the CITES data. Also, it can connect with applications such as um, Python and Streamlit, which we are using for machine learning. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, in, in addition, uh, Superset was developed in Python. So for configuration and other things, I mean, you need a bit of Python to, to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just curious, what type of tools uh, still get for visualization? Of, uh, No. The question is, uh, why did we use Streamlit for the visualizations? Oh, why did we not use Streamlit, but rather use Superset? Yeah. I mean, when we started like with this work, we, we looked at Power BI, but we had an issue, I mean, with licensing right and then even publishing the the dashboards and then so we we wanted uh as tanya's uh like one of the, one of the slides i mean she was explaining the the reasons why we went for superset like costs and, and all of those things right and we're looking for 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 bi2 so we yeah we, we found superset and then we tested it out and yeah and i think it's not really uh I have little knowledge of it, but I don't think it's a it's a BI tool, right? You can do like a, a visualizations and things for your machine learning stuff, but but it's not really a, you know a BI tool. So we need a, need a BI tool to expand on what we already had on on DHS two. And for the HRIF use case, we needed uh, data from multiple sources, and it was allowing us to. You know, superset was allowing us to to make those connections, mm -hmm. and also to make the, the the same visualizations available on on DHS too. So yeah. There was a question online. When will your app be on the app? <laughs> okay. Um. We we are aiming to to have it on the app hub. You know, uh, by before end of the year. Because we we've just sort of put everything you know together now and it's coming together very well. So hopefully by end of the the year, uh, we'll have it in the app. Okay. Yeah. If not sooner. Yeah. If not sooner. <laughs> Thank you. There was another question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. An example of? Oh, don't have a online a question. Um, can you? Yep, sure. Amrit, you can have, take that. The question is, uh, can we show an example or speak to an example of the superset um, dashboard? Data and then push them 
put them onto calculators that would um, uh, indicate this in systems without having to push data between systems and then you start getting confused with which is the source system. Keep your source data in your source system and do your analysis from somewhere else. Yeah. So, so you understand. Yeah, but please join the universal health coverage session tomorrow to actually see that integration. The question is, um, did Superset, did the platform itself have sufficient um, visualization options or did we need to further customize? Okay. Some So. Uh, okay, like in, in, in terms of visualizations, we 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 didn't have to add in new visualizations. It's more on like pulling the the right data, and then we have a wide variety of uh, visualizations that we could pick from. So we didn't have to customize or add anything new. Just more on your data sources, making sure that you have all the data you need, and then just like in DHS, then you can pick the, the right visualizations for, for your data. Yeah. yeah. At, at this time, the, the visualizations are quite extensive. We haven't come across a situation where we needed to customize yeah. as yet. <laughs> There's quite extensive um, um, capabilities. A question? Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with Superset, it's low cost and open source, which is great. But you mentioned that people need some coding experience. Are there any other things that people can take into account when they're comparing the DI tools? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, for 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 us, uh, it was more like you know for for the ministries of health or for the clients that we work with, right? Not to be restricted by by like, because we like I said, we started with Power BI and then we had challenges with with licenses. So we needed some, something that you know we could implement for for, for them without restrict you know yeah restrictions on licenses and and all of those things. So. So yeah, and yeah. Superset, you know, came in handy for us. But in terms of programming, it was just for the app to make sure that the visualizations are also available on DHS too. So we had to 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 to, to build the app and also be able to interact with the Superset, you know, API. But once it's set up, I mean, like for example, the the app that we built, once it's it's, it's set up, I mean, it's generic. Uh, then you'll be able to pull like anything from superset so you need any programming so yes for configuration configuring superset and allowing permissions and all of those things you will need your your system admins to to assist you with that but once that is done then you just just use it and yeah and then you'll manage permissions i think that's the only thing that additional thing that you you would need to do yeah mm -hmm. okay there's another question from the gentleman yep Okay, so are you saying um, that as we start pulling a lot and lots of data into Superset for analysis, is is it able to um, to still function well with that load of information? Okay. Okay. Data mm -hmm. is variation of velocity of data volume. Yeah. You do not mention about the velocity of variation of data handling. Another question is your system can you handle the distributed system or distributed data needs? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the first one, I think it's around, um, um, Superset is not actually holding all the data, but it's actually pulling when needed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For example, uh, we have a centralized data system. Yes. Yeah. Of yeah. The city, and then, and we have 64 data in 64. Yeah. This we need only 5 to 10 percent, uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 percent frequency in the centralized database for quite but 80 to 90 percent in query uh, editing is local, is it in local database. So we need to put fragment database is based upon vertically or horizontally, and it will be a distributed in different locations. Mm. So it will be very faster. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I think I understand. In one of the, the slides that uh, Tanya presented, so in terms of connections, I mean, you can go via the, the connector, right? Like, like, like for example, in, uh, if you want to map to the DHS3 API, but you can also add the different connections to your other you know, databases, and then you'll be able to query them within the, the data set. So yeah, it can, it can do that as well. Not sure if like that answers your question, but but maybe you can look at your particular use case and then and then discuss. Yeah. yeah. We can definitely have a side discussion to further unpack. I'm sorry, Thanks. Then I have to <laughs> okay. For, for oh, okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Folks. Last question. But we do have a tea break and lunch, <laughs> and we're all here together. <laughs> okay. If it's fast, is it fast? Okay. You got one minute. First of all, I really want to appreciate uh, this extension of Vitae. And I really like the idea that you are using the open sources to cut down the uh, cost. So uh, this is really appreciated. So uh, actually, we have developed a product which is similar to that. But that product uh, um, is, uh, has a key analytica which is running on different platforms. So my question is, uh, are you using the same database and same API running on the same DHIS2 uh, platform or it is running on different platforms and different databases? Yeah, we'll get that. Uh, um, okay, we are, we are connecting differently, right? Like for, for DHIS2, then we'll have a user account, right? That's like that's created on DHIS2. And then we meet, we map the DHS2 API to like to superset, right? So so basically in terms of the queries, like superset queries uh, DHS2 via the connector, right? Using the, the API. The uh, yes, so but but it's through the, the API, like uh, you know how the query yeah happens. So so yeah, like for example, say if you want to query uh, maybe organizational units, like for example, right? That happens through the, the connector. And then you're able to put. Yeah, yeah, yes. The, yes, we use that then when we, for, for, the, for the, the portal app. So for the app, a portal app to pull the visualizations in, then, then you interact with the superset uh, API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, of course. Yep. Great job. Uh, it works. Oh, and if anybody hiding in the back wants to actually sit on the front row and get a good view. That's a great time to come down. <laughs> Call up. No, you, no, you've never hidden from anything in your life. So it's okay. We, let's see. There's a couple of slides where it's a little hard to see. So yeah, you really would benefit from being down front. Hi, right. good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Painter. I'm from the Centers for Disease Control in the malaria branch. I work with the Presence Malaria Initiative, largely in the sub-Saharan African countries, where we use DHIS2 to monitor our malaria programs. 
uh, brief outline. I'm going to give a moment of appreciation for DHIS2 before I go on to tell you why DHIS2 is not enough. <laughs> uh, this is particularly for the analysts in the group. Um, but uh, the, the other folks, I hope you'll appreciate it as well. And in order to provide what is at least maybe uh, enough, uh, we made a web-based app to help fill in some of the, the gaps that we see. Now, I won't be going through a live demo because at least one very wise uh, programmer has told me that that's a bad idea. So I've got some screenshots to show you as I talk through why we do what we do. So the moment of appreciation. Uh, we go to the most hard to reach health facilities all over the world. And DHIS2 has been really impressive how it's transformed our surveillance from very really unmanageable paper to analyzable digital form. Uh, it's been a, a game changer. Now, so it's really easy to access health facility data, but does it tell the whole story? No, that's the problem. And to go from data to really good action, we need more than just the raw data that's in DHIS2. And I hope to show you some examples of why that's true. Um, ideally, when we think about an analytic plan, it should involve documenting what data you're going to use, controlling for reporting bias, removing outliers, and then doing some statistical models to get the best uh, idea of what whether there's change, whether that change is real or just some random variation. So uh, we've gone through a lot of code to do this, but in order to make it sort of more available to most users, we created an external app. And that has been dubbed by one of our partners, Magic Classes. It is an intervention effectiveness and trend analysis tool. It starts, of course, with the DHIS2 instance and then uses the API uh, to connect to an instance of R uh, that we run with R Studio. That instance then hosts the app that makes it visible in a browser through a Shiny application. We use the API to access the metadata, to access actual data, do the data cleaning and munging, various visualizations, and then lastly, the advanced analytics, the time series models. All right. So here's a quick screenshot of the app. It is set up with some tabs across the top, so you can go from setup to analysis in six pages. Okay. Starts by putting in your credentials for the instance you want to get to, and a place where you want to store the data. All this is the data is stored locally. So the first issues that we wanted to solve was finding and documenting the data that's in the DHIS2. We found that for the countries we work with, metadata is unavailable to most of the DHIS2 end users. You know, if you go to the DHIS2 demo, you see all the things an admin would see. It's great. But when you're a lowly end user, <laughs> you don't see all that. Only three of the 11 countries that I reviewed had um, a metadata app that was available where they could see some of the elements. The funny thing is that's all actually available through the API. The problem is it comes in, in in a format for most people is not readable, but uh, we do the business of translating it into a readable form. Uh, the whole, part of the reason for this is that we frequently find that different numbers are published for things like confirmed cases of malaria. If you go to the World Malaria Report for a country, you see one number. If you go to the country's annual report, you see one number. If you go to PMI's report, you end up with a different number because each time a different analyst has pulled the number. And naively, people said, like, oh, well, uh, I want to see what are your number of confirmed cases. But the DHIS2 instance doesn't have a variable called confirmed cases. What it has is a uh, case positive for malaria RDT, or it's a case that's positive for uh, bimicroscopy, or it has outpatient case cases, inpatient cases, community health worker cases. And we don't know which ones were pulled. So it's very hard often to compare data sets when we want to have, have data that's reproducible. So this first step is being able to expose to everyone what is available. For most of our countries, there is many as 10,000 data elements. They're not all malaria data elements, but you know, there's hundreds of them. And if you've ever you know, tried to go like the, the visualizer app or the pivot table app, you get a box this size 
to try and find your, your data element. So this is exposed to them and you can search by data elements by name, data set, the period type, et cetera, so that we don't confuse monthly data elements with weekly data elements. And we expose the indicators as well, importantly showing what is in the denominator and the numerator. So it's spelled out so that we can see. Uh, one country I went to, they were really aggravated that their indicator for confirmed cases did not match what they would have pulled by themselves. And they had no idea why it was. They came to say, we can't trust THIS2. We should go back to our old system. We looked it up here and we found that when the, when the uh, HMIS folks built the indicator, they'd accidentally written in one of the data elements twice. So therefore all the numbers didn't quite add up, but they had no way of seeing that themselves just with their access to DHS too. After browsing the, all the data elements, we asked people to make a data dictionary, define exactly what you want to include, and you can say, I want to download this data for a set time period. You get a progress bar, the API is called, and after a bit of time, you have all of that data. And then once it's downloaded, you actually don't need any more internet connectivity, which is a, a great help for, for some folks. So at that point, you can work with the data offline. All right, so now we have the data, let's analyze it. We're gonna check for completeness and potential for reporting bias, and we're gonna check for outliers. So completeness and outliers. We all know that when you go from a register like you see on the left over to the digital home, that the errors are gonna happen. I mean, that's not as really, it, it you know, should happen if you're doing that much of it. And a huge investment is made in making sure that facilities do this correctly. That's their data quality checks. But we found that even when the data quality is high, there's actually potentially a much greater problem uh, when we don't know how many facilities provided the data. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So that's um, involves something we call reporting bias. It's a potentially a huge problem with aggregated data. And if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's this, okay? So an example, this is uh, one of our countries um, where there's high levels of malaria. So we saw, I selected a county from August, 2021, and I pulled out four data elements that I thought would be the typical thing someone would want to review when looking at data from this county. What's the first attendance at the outpatient clinics? Total number of sus uh, suspected malaria cases, the total number that were tested for malaria, and then those that were confirmed with malaria. And now typically what we do is we'll take those first two values and say, okay, what percentage of patients coming to the facility um, were suspected with malaria? 14% in a highly endemic month in a highly endemic country is low. Um, it calls into question whether or not providers were thinking about malaria or were dismissing fevers as something else. And then we look at, okay, among those suspected of malaria, how many were tested? We have a, well, what is our program? Roughly $750 million per year to ensure that every fever in a malaria endemic country is tested. And here in this country, it receives a ton of money only 35% of cases were tested. That is very low. And yet, of those, we had 126% that were positive. Yeah. Right. Now, yesterday, there was a great talk. And I put this line on screen. I thought, oh, that's, a, that's a great line. I agree with that. HMIS is the cornerstone of information policy and planning in country. Yes, that's why we have it. That's why we want to use DHIS too. But if this is the data that's the cornerstone for your project, what are people going to conclude? Either that this program is seriously underperforming or the data is bad, or both. But this gets to what the really underlying problem is, is how many facilities provided the data for these numbers? Okay. So, what I've put down in the second column here is the number of facilities that provided the number in the first column. And you'll notice that in this county, there's 219 facilities that provided the number for first attendance. 
and yet only 76 facilities provided a number for testing for malaria, and twice as many of the facilities gave a number for confirmed malaria, which you may remember we had more confirmed malaria cases than tested. I think that's pretty obvious why that is now. Right? So it wasn't that the data was bad or that you know, this malaria program was, was seriously deficient. It's just that we only had partial data. And interestingly enough, you notice how there's different numbers for each of these elements. And if I had gone to the, the program officer and said, well, what's the reporting rate here in this county? They'd say, oh, it's fantastic. It's actually, there was, interestingly enough, the expected reports, there was 261, um, and 253 reports were received, a, a reporting rate of 97%. Oddly, that didn't include, uh, all of them didn't even put down first attendance because only 219 facilities filled that in. So this reporting rate for the data set just tells you that the form was sent in. So technically they reported, but it doesn't mean that all the elements were filled in. So what we really need is not the data set reporting, but the data element reporting. So that percent reporting rate is, is unfortunately very deceptive. So one of the things that the Magic Glasses app does is it identifies the facilities that are consistently reporting so that we can look at the data from those facilities and not mix up those that are reporting this month and not the next month. Okay. And we find that if we restrict our analysis to these facilities, we effectively eliminate reporting bias. Now, if you do remove some facilities from your analysis, you can't do things like what's the total number of cases necessarily. But what you can get is a better sense of these ratios and trends over time. So while I was pointing out the data for one month, obviously the analogous problem happens when you're looking over many months. So on the left-hand side, you see a chart of the number of malaria cases over many years for the facilities that didn't report every month. And this is actually the majority of the facilities and it gives the impression that malaria is on the rise. Again, given our investment in malaria control, this is very disturbing. But if you restrict the analysis to the facilities that reported every month, you see that it's basically a flat line, which also is a little bit disturbing, frankly, but nonetheless, a very different picture. So compared to the facilities that reported every month, the facilities that didn't report show increasing malaria, and that is probably due to just then, over time, they started reporting more, and it skews the data. Another thing that skews the data is outliers. We go through several algorithms to try and screen values that don't make sense. An example, like when someone was supposed to put in 105 cases and it became 1,050, um, those kind of errors. There are errors that happen because they're of enormous magnitude. And there's also errors that, that while they look like they're in kind of the right range, maybe 100 cases, they shouldn't have that during the, you know, during the driest months. So we can pick up both seasonal and, um, and overall outliers. Now, there are other ways of doing outliers. I'm not going to compare the algorithms, but I want to point out is a really a key difference between what we're doing here and what happens in the WHO data quality tool. And that's the, um, after identifying these outliers, I can remove them from the analysis and I can document which ones you do. Whereas in the WHO data quality tool, it's great at flagging the outliers, but the idea is they're flagged so the facility can go back and change them. But if they haven't changed that value, the data remains in the data set and that continues to be used for the analysis. So all those erroneous values will screw up the finely tuned analysis that we want to have later on. Okay. All this is to get to this final step of really being able to evaluate, are things getting better or worse? How well do our interventions work? The key is that we start now with data from the facilities with the most reliable data, those that report every month, or sometimes we can allow a little bit of wiggle room, maybe report 11 of the 12 months, and then the outliers being censored. Okay. 
So displayed here is a time series of malaria cases from one of our countries. And you notice that there was a big drop happening in 2019. And so to investigate that, we set sort of an intervention date. In fact, there was an intervention. There was a, there was a large bed net campaign here. And then we apply a number of time series models. I won't go into all the different ones, but there's not just a single one. There's many different ones and they, um, they may fit better or worse. And we use a series of cross-validation techniques to find for each facility what is the best model fit. Then when we find the best fitting model, we use that to forecast what we believe probably would have happened had there not been an intervention. And we can, and that's what's shown here with the dotted line. And you can't see it on your screen, but there's a gray shaded area around it because this kind of forecast obviously has some confidence interval. So from that best fitted model, we we compare the expected values with the actual values, which are shown in red. And in this case, the best fitted model estimates a 39% reduction over 12 months, which is a fantastic impact from that bed net campaign. Turns out that bed net campaign was actually a little bit more complicated. It had a couple of different bed nets and also um, a few alternative um, uh, vector control strategies. And we were able to split the data and compare the impact of each of those uh, interventions during the same time period. Here's uh, another example now of uh, that's a little, a little bit, uh, takes it an extra step. And that's investigating an unexplained drop in cases, 2021, 2022, actually it's going through to the present. Um, what you see here is the number of confirmed cases of malaria. Um, I'm not documenting, it, it is documented exactly what data element's going at, but for the purpose of this, I'm just gonna say confirmed cases of malaria. And this is the raw data. This is what you would see in DHIS2. And you notice some amazing peaks and valleys. Um, the impression that was given to me from the NMCP is that well, malaria just swings up and down and it goes that way every couple of years. Well, and now they have a couple of years that are down. Given there was a pandemic during this time period, one of the biggest things that I was like, oh, is it possible that facilities aren't reporting anymore? That would be, uh, that could be very problematic. So we want to know, is this decline in cases real? Is it due to a lack of reporting? Could it be due to decreased attendance, perhaps lack of testing? So we did, um, again, applying some uh, statistical techniques from R, we recreated, a, we created an adjusted corrected confirmed cases that controls for the potential for lower testing rates or lower attendance. And we then um, made a second time series that we believe is the closer to the real number of confirmed cases. That said, we saw that there was still a large decline, decline of 51% that was not explained by lack of reporting, decreased care seeking or decreased testing. So this is, you know, extremely useful example for the for the malaria program that may indicate a real decline in malaria transmission. I'm going to skip ahead to one more example here, and that's about something called minimal de detectable change. Uh, maybe not the best phrase, but the idea is that with the emphasis that we have on data quality, sometimes you just have to ask, well, look, when is good good enough? When can we, we always want to keep making sure facilities do well, but we often find that there's always an example of a facility that had bad data or, you know, an outlet or something. And so it's easy to say, oh, we need to double down on data quality analysis. But you really have to ask, but when is it finally going to be good enough? And I'd say that depends on the size of the change you want to detect. So for instance, going back to the data set that I showed you earlier, the best fitting model I could find for the data, the historic data uh, going up to, this is 2018, had a fit that was only about 29%, meaning that if there was a change that was greater than 29% or le sorry, less than 29%, I wouldn't be able to say that that was a real change and not just some random variation in the data. 
that means that if we had an intervention that was supposed to make a 20% impact, I don't know that I could actually detest, detect it statistically. Similarly, if my cases swung up by 20%, I may not be able to say that uh, that's really important. And yet, following the same country through their data quality improvement program, they've gotten to a point where they're at a 10% fix. And actually, last time data not shown here, it's about 5 to 7%, which means that if they want to, if they have an intervention that they're trying to examine, they should be able to see any change that's greater than five to seven percent. And honestly, that's and we're unlikely to do any intervention that's that's supposed to have an impact that's less than that. So one could say that probably for this country, the data is now good enough to do what you want to do. So I just summarize uh, data report to DHS2 provides a it's a fantastic basis for evaluating program implementation and effectiveness. However, the uncorrected data is potentially really misleading. And the data doesn't need to be perfect, but it does need to have a systematic analytic process to use that data. And we hope that to improve program evaluation, we could get external analysis apps like this installed alongside DHIS2 so that we could make the best use of the data we have. If anyone's interested in looking at the app, all of the R code is available at the GitHub site that is listed here. Thank you. Cool. Um, so we will have a few minutes for uh, questions as well. But one thing I, I just wanted to re-emphasize is that you know we've been talking about this for a couple of years now, and John made it extremely clear to us. Um, that data set reporting rate analysis is not enough. If that's all you're doing, you're not doing enough. And you have to be looking at data element reporting rates because people are cheating. They're, they're not filling in the data sets and they know that and they know that you monitor for that. And that's what they're being graded on. Yeah, and it's a perverse incentive because yeah. they're also being monitoring getting it in on time which means that, well, I'd like to fill that in, but I'd be better off getting credit for getting it in on time than actually having it filled so, out. So John's presentation, yeah, Carl, I'm sure you got a lot to say. John's presentation, <laughs> we'll get to it. John's presentation inspired us to write some guidance documents on how to use standard DHIS2 to look at data element reporting rates. And I think I'm still probably the only person who's read it, but it is on our website. We have a data quality guidance document on our website. Please have a look at that and you utilize some of the uh, tactics. We got the inspiration yeah. from John and, and uh, we're hoping that countries actually start using it, but I don't think anyone actually has yet. Um, okay, Colin, you have a question? Yeah, two comments. Uh, one is that a lot of what you're talking about is things that you fundamentally can address through better tools that you're mm -hmm. presenting and also the systematic analysis and monitoring of what's happening. But I'm also interested in why do we have so many problems? Mm -hmm. Because I looked at lots of different countries, okay? And I see an enormous backlog in metadata quality, in data quality, et cetera. Things that should be done, even the very basic things are not being done. And I think analyzing why, and I would like to mention just two things. Mm -hmm. One, I think the problem that DHIS2 being generally a centralized system, very often under the real control of informatics people, of computer science people, and not health managers. It means that they simply don't see where yes. data don't make any sense from a health and a health management perspective. Yeah. And to take a practical example here, and I, I do a lot of work in Sierra Leone, I've been working with them for six years now, setting up their IDSR system, particularly the case-based IDSR system. And what I find there is that the disease surveillance managers, their thinking is A, still paper-based. Mm. They're thinking like forms and data being sent from you know, site to site, instead of thinking, oh, we have a central database. So their thinking is like we exercise control through through uh, paper forms. 
and also what they're used to is weekly aggregated data. But the fact is that weekly aggregated data is only suspects, right? It's not confirmed cases. Now when we have a case-based system, which is actually slightly now getting better, have higher reporting rates, we can see that we didn't have 93%, sorry, 93 cases of acute viral hemorrhagic fever in 2022. We had 10 confirmed loss of fever cases. All the other 83 cases were after lab analysis found to be, you know, non-confirmed or, or, or false. So I'm just saying here, a main problem here is actually to change the way health managers think about their data. And just to give you one thing you could do in any country instance, look at data elements and indicate and see how many of them have proper definitions. I can tell you, you're going to find in most countries, 80% has no definition at all. All the definition is just a copy of the name of the data element and indicator. And that it reflects a fundamental problem how managers are interacting with data and information. Yeah, those are good comments. Thank you. The, the, the name magic glasses came from a health manager who said, oh, she could finally see what, what was in the system. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very wide, wise words from the father of DHIS. Any, I mean, he wrote the, the original code for DHIS. Um, any actual questions? Yes. Like to explain, you know, uh, when you have partially complete data, you can analyze that data. Uh, my other question is, can we use machine learning to predict the missing data? You know, so maybe yeah. you use some past data and all the like the yeah. Can you say that? Okay, we don't have this data from this for example location for this period, but yeah. looking at you know, can you predict that what that would have been? Is yeah. That yeah, it's a great question, um, which was, can we use machine learning or other techniques to uh, impute the missing values rather than just censor them? And I spent a lot of time looking at that, thinking about it. I don't know that I necessarily came up with the best answer, but what I found was it was very hard to predict what that missing value was. And in so doing, I was imposing my model onto that data when really I want the data to tell me what the model is first. So I worried about the tail was wagging the dog. Um, that said, there may be some more sophisticated ways of imputing the values from neighboring facilities that could adjust for it. But in the end, I decided this, the simplest to truest uh, method would be just to look at the facilities that reported every month where there wasn't missing data. Hopefully that's a majority, that's a, it's a good representative sample of the, of the facilities. If it's not, that's problematic, but in most of the instances where I look, it, it appears to be a very representative sample, both geographically and in terms of small clinics, large clinics, et cetera. John, there's a question online about differentiating between zeros and blanks. Yeah, yeah. That's another th thing that, that people didn't able to see in magic glasses. You know this, but they really don't, is that um, zeros sometimes are not stored in DHIS2, but it's a setting that is done by data element. It's not that, oh, Malawi doesn't store them and Zimbabwe does. It is a question of which data element has it. And that's one of the attributes that is visible when you look at and measure at the data elements. It says whether or not it's there, and, and so it, it is something to be mindful of. And uh, fortunately, in most instances for things like malaria cases, I've seen that countries have turned that switch off so that zeros are recorded. Uh, we have a couple more questions, maybe. Yeah, it's not that, but it has more of a comment than a question for example, that is not enough. What is for content? Can you calculate how many of the elements are there? That's one way to do that. But sometimes it might also be interesting to very specific and how are they? Uh, particular uh, So we have this. Uh, 
That's good. I mean, it means you're looking at it. So thanks. I appreciate that. I wanted to, when Scott and I had a conversation a couple of years ago, but the question was, it was the comment was, it was about looking at the completeness of the form. Um, if, and I remember when people ask me, well, why don't they just require there to be an entry? You can't submit the form unless there's an entry. That would uh, do it. And I remember Scott telling me once that when you looked at that, that becomes a real barrier to getting the form in. And the fact is there are sometimes hundreds, uh, one country, uh, I guess I won't name, their monthly form has uh, over 1,000 boxes on it. And the, you know, and it's rare things. It might be viral hemorrhagic fever. They're going to be left blank. Uh, another common example is uh, stock data. Um, the, uh, there's a box for number of days stock out, and they often leave that blank because they didn't have any days stocked out. Yeah, it'd be nice if they wrote a zero, but at least they wrote on the other boxes, you know. So there will be some uh, blanks that are there that are um, implicit implicit zeros. And if we spec if we require everyone to, to write a zero, I think there'll be a lot of pushback. We're gonna we're gonna have to end it here, guys. So we're already Excellent. over. So let's give John another.